I have a question. So it is, uh, uh, while we all understand how important palliative care is, so the, the palliative care experts are uh, rarities. So uh, that, that's what I uh, am challenged with. Every time I, I have to make a referral to palliative care experts, you know, they are totally overbooked. Yeah, <laughs> I think we all kind of just look I at share each other. Your distress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that is a reality that the need is talked about to a great degree, um, but the uh, available resources, um, basically even in kind of urban academic medical centers, we have unmet need. And I, as you progress away, um, trying to make do with what you have uh, is a very real challenge. But if actually on the CAPC, that uh, Center to Advance Palliative Care, there is um, some pretty specific, almost talking points on how to advocate for palliative care, how to make good evidence-based recommendations for your system for palliative care, um, and that can be a helpful way to kind of crystallize what the need is for, for administrators and for hospital groups, et cetera. I'd also advocate for visiting the Vital Talk website because Again, Tony Bach is one of you guys, and he, he really geared his education towards oncologists and how to have some of these challenging conversations. It's a fantastic program, um, and he does offer in-person teaching sessions a couple times a year for folks. They're not cheap, <laughs> so I will tell you that. But really, all it takes is your institution investing in one person, and that person can come back and disseminate the information. So if your institution can really just invest in one person, or if one person has the means to go to a session, then I really recommend it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'll, I'll say I, I totally agree. I think, I think that there's two concepts that I think, Annie, you talked about in the beginning, with, and I think both of you mentioned this concept of primary palliative care, um, which I, I, I think will probably be one of the future topics of, of this discussion. But uh, there is a, a level that, that all of us are trying to teach, which is just the, the basic, simple part of palliative care that any provider can do. Um, which is an important thing to, to pull together. The other thing is, is, uh, and I, I've been a part of this uh, pretty heavily recently, but is making the case for, the business case for palliative care is difficult, meaning um, it can be done. It's just hard to sort out all the numbers and, and you, have to, you have to involve the financial people, you have to involve all of those groups and the key stakeholders in your in your organizations to say, hey, look, this is why um, it makes sense financially. Uh, right now, with all that uh, the Affordable Care Act was trying to do, was trying to do to introduce value-based care into the systems in the hospitals, um, recognizing that palliative care providers can reduce cost uh, for their DRG and actually becomes a, a a benefit to them financially and so there's a lot of things that you have to work on one thing that actually in our clinic is has been fun is they introduced a house calls program which allows the providers to just go visit the patients in their home that are that are homebound and that also has has been very clearly shown to save money uh, the house calls situation uh, the most recent publication showed a 32 percent cost savings in medicare patients which is substantial so there are ways to sell this business wise to your your entities and that's really important to try and figure out and not just do what most of us as physicians do is gloss over the finances because we don't really care about it or we've we've never been taught any of the financial aspects of it so I, that's what there's a lot of reasons and then palliative care fellowships have just kind of come onto the scene it's kind of it's really relatively speaking a new specialty so that's why the la there's a lack of, of availability right now, but there, there are a lot of fellowships coming, so. Any others? Uh, how do you interact with uh, um, So, that's a great question. I think that, um, you know, like I said, I have a particular interest in kind of um, 
kind of uh, cultural humility um, in the process of palliative mm -hmm. care, in, in approaching end of life, in introducing palliative care, um, whether that's uh, kind of, uh, you know. They want to, I think they want to hear more. Is it, how's that? Oh. <laughs> I was hiding under a mic that you couldn't hear. It makes me a lot more authoritarian. Um, so I, I think that uh, getting a sense of, of religious, the import of religion to patients, getting a sense of their interpretation um, of religion and how uh, their religion applies to their end of life is a part of just the palliative care assessment in general. Um, I think that almost like some palliative care is uh, like primary palliative care and some palliative care is specialty palliative care. I think in that uh, religion piece, I, I, I want to go there a little bit, um, but when, when I recognize that there is more challenges, I'm appreciative of the chaplain that's on our team. Um, I've worked with imams, I've worked with rabbis, I've worked with chaplains in our hospital when we don't have access to other faiths but are serving the role for various groups that might not be the, the, their religious practice, um, kind of engaging in that spiritual question. Um, so I, I, I think that you know, there's no inherent conflict, and I think that it's a part of understanding the values of the patient. <laughs> yeah, so I will, I will first acknowledge the moral distress um, on the part of the <laughs> practitioner who feels that they're participating in a system that they don't feel like the right thing is happening, but they feel like they have to do it. Um, and that's, that's an important part of palliative care. Um, and I, I, I have had that. I think that, again, um, so this kind of idea of truth-telling and giving patients all of the information and shared decision-making is relatively new um, over the last three decades or so, has not always been the kind of general values, um, and in some, in some arenas a, a more kind of parentalistic approach was kind of appreciated, and I, I do come across it a lot. Again, in Seattle I have many uh, Somali uh, patients, I have many Cambodian patients, um, et cetera, various groups, and again, any family can feel any way. It, it's not that they're 100% uh, represented by the general cultural norms, but I do encounter that a lot, where families say, you know what, I don't want you to talk about it. Um, and as a, as a doctor and as a healer, I think that, you know, you're talking about the patient's death actually invokes death. Um, and again, that's part of the assessment um, and trying to get a sense of, who in the family can I discuss this with in a way that's appropriate? Um, how toxic do they feel like certain taboos may be? Um, and, and then again, kind of as, as Daryl had said, how do I frame this in a way that kind of balances giving families information and uh, maintaining hope and your role as a healer? But it's challenging. I mean, those are, these are the most challenging patients for sure. I'd also say, um, yeah, religion's a tricky subject, and it scares a lot of doctors, I think, because if you are, um, if your family or your patient is coming from a different religious background than yourself, it's a whole different arena or ball game that you, maybe you're not familiar with. So I often come from a place of curiosity, and will say, huh, tell me more about that, you know? Um, I, you know, I think we all come from different backgrounds, so curiosity, a, a respectful curiosity of, wow, that sounds really important to you. Can you share with me a little bit more about that? Really helps figure out where they're coming from, and that can really shed light on where they're at. And I think a lot of the other tools that we use are sort of adjacent questions, like, what are you really worried about here? Tell me, tell me what's really concerning you. Um, or, you know, wow, it seems like your religion provides a really strong sense of support for you. Tell me what you're hoping for. So really just kind of 
asking adjacent questions can sometimes open the door to those scarier subjects or things that they want you to avoid. They'll talk about within a realm that's comfortable for them. So again, just really coming from a place of curiosity and asking those adjacent questions can be very helpful. And I would just say also, don't be afraid of miracle talk because I think a lot of times our trainees in the hospital or our, our team gets consulted because the family will have said something like, I'm really, you know, I, I, um, I'm hoping for a miracle. And then the team just gets scared and consults palliative care, but they don't stop to ask, like, what does that mean to you? And then to broaden the conversation, because that can really help. Um, but yeah, our, our teams, for some reason, get really, really scared when, when patients or families start talking about miracles or religion. And it's just something that we're not trained to talk about and we're not used to talking about. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't be afraid of it. It's just a, a door opening. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, th I think that that happens occasionally, and I think, I think it's, uh, I, I love what you talked about, the warm handoff and things like that uh, are very important to give, give your views on prognostication. Um, that's why I think this, the communication and the, the working together is extremely important. Um, yeah, yeah. And I will say that as a palliative care provider and hospice provider, but also as an internal medicine doctor, I want feedback, you know? So if, yeah. if, if people have feedback for me as a consulting palliative care doctor, I want to hear it because I want to, you know, you're the customer, you're yeah. the client, you need to be satisfied with what you're, what you're getting. So I would encourage you all, empower you all to give that feedback. I agree with that 100%. And I would also say that, acknowledge that just like in any field of medicine, so just like there are probably good oncologists and maybe colleagues that you wouldn't necessarily want treating your, your loved one, I would say the same thing about palliative care <laughs> providers. <laughs> True. There are some <laughs> providers who really agree that you know, the role of palliative care is extremely collaborative and it's really trying to figure out what you know, your, your colleague is hoping for, what the patient or family is hoping for, and to help match the medical treatment to that and your, your services to that. And then there are other providers out there who are stuck you know, five to 10 years back where they're like, no, my role is to provide end of life care, so I'm gonna try to move this patient towards comfort focused care, when that's not appropriate. And we've all, we've all known one or two of those providers, and again, it's like any field where some of your colleagues are very skillful and others have some, some ways to go and things to learn. And, and I completely agree. And I will say that as someone who was, was drawn to palliative care because of an interest in language and uh, you know, the sensibility, I initially in residency felt like my job was to convince people to be comfort care in the most kind way possible. And that's not the palliative care method. Um, and that's not the fundamentals of palliative care. Um, and so over the course of time, I have learned that you know, the fundamentals are really understanding what the patient understands, communicating what you know about the illness, and coming up and, and then learning about the patient themselves and what's most important, and then tailoring the care. And there's nothing inherent in any of that that says, it must be comfort care, must be DNR, it must be you know, life at all cost. It's all negotiable and I have patients that follow anything on that spectrum and it's my job to learn what's most appropriate and to make recommendations based on what I learn about them rather than my own kind of biases. Other questions? I might just go back to the opioid question. Yeah, I was going I, to. Yeah, yeah, I think good. that's really important. Um, and I think, you know, pain has so many different domains. 
and I, I'm sure you've all seen, I've, I, the cases that stick out in my mind the most are, you know, pain again, there's the, uh, what feeds into it can be immense, right? You're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. So what feeds into pain? Well, there's social stressors, there's emotional, there's existential stress, and that's why palliative care and hospice teams are often very interdisciplinary, including social workers and chaplains. Um, and so I, I think the cases that stick out most in my mind are the patients who were so afraid of dying that no matter what we did, we could not get their pain or symptoms under control, and they died horrible deaths in fear. Um, and when you can't get that fear under control, there's no chance that you are also going to get their pain under control. And those are the patients who often end up be being, you know, palliatively sedated at the end of their lives. And it's horrible to watch. And so I, I really emphasize addressing those multiple domains. And again, that's really hard to do in your half an hour oncology clinic appointment. So how do you do that? Um, and I think, you know, you really need to, again, rely on your interdisciplinary colleagues. So if you know your social worker has some skill in grief and bereavement or life review or legacy work, um, I really recommend highly utilizing those. If your social worker doesn't have skills in those areas, like, encourage them to seek out training in those areas because all of that feeds into pain. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, Opioids are our tools. Until they come up with better medications, they are going to be a part of your toolkit no matter what. And we luckily have different opioids, so you can rotate them, you can see which ones work best for your patients. But what I often couple that with is, what is your pain preventing you from doing that you want to do? So the, the assessment that I use is, what is it limiting you from doing functionally, because if I treat you with this opioid pain medicine and that does not improve, I don't want to just see your pain score improve, your number of 5 out of 10 goes down to 3 out of 10, that's fine too, but what I'm really trying to figure out is, wow, so you know what, what you're telling me is that this level of pain at 5 out of 10 pain um, you can't play with your grandchildren or you can't go for a walk with your wife. When I treat you, my goal is to get your pain down to an acceptable level where you can play with your grandchildren or you can go for that walk with your wife. And so that's how I measure things and that's how I explain things to patients because I want it to be coupled not just with improvement in pain, but I want it to be coupled with something that is functional that we can measure that you can do. So I, I was just gonna ask maybe if you don't mind uh, a further question, you just mentioned opioids, and there's a lot of different scenarios that play out. One of them is, you know, do you expect that a palliative care provider is just going to show up and just give them opioids? Is that the expectation, or uh, that right now there's a lot of legal, medical legal issues with the op opioids, and the FDA is uh, further regulating and, and decreasing the production of opioids, and there's a whole bunch of national things happening. And then obviously there's so many people that are overusing and it's a high risk of death and things like that. I guess I'm wondering if there was a particular piece of the question you were referring to with opioids. Uh, I'm sure we could all speak a lot to all of those <laughs> issues. That, but well, it has become more time, time intensive to manage. Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that that is, again, a challenge. Um, I think that having clear expectations with the referring primary care doctor about kind of at what point you may kind of be referring back to them for ongoing tapering as appropriate, um, whether, you know, that's, I mean, also kind of an expectation 
um, set in the beginning, you know, oh, we're going to be treating you with opioids in the course of this, but I anticipate that with your treatment over the course of the next month, two years, we'll be able to wean you off of these medications, and so that's something that's kind of built into the plan. Um, but I, I do think that kind of, yeah, engagement of that multidisciplinary team, just in case there's another driver there, um, social stressors, emotional stressors, et cetera, that are kind of, uh, that are kind of, um, kind of making, making the pain strangely difficult to control. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of things that we could talk about, but the, thank, thank you all. I uh, greatly appreciate being a part of this.